watching Inside Automotive with Jim Fitzpatrick. Hey everyone, Jim Fitzpatrick. Thanks so much for joining us on another edition of Inside Automotive right here on the CBT Automotive Network. We're so happy to have with us Mr. Mark Phelan, who is the auto critic and columnist for the Detroit Free Press. Mark, thank you so much for joining us once again on the show. It's great to see you, Jim. Sure. So, uh, you know, lots happened since you were on the show last. One of the uh, events out there was the Detroit Auto Show. I'd love to get your take on that. And as you know, we're we're in the midst right now of the uh, the entire industry transforming itself into the EVs. Uh, you know, the, the EVs that are headed our way in the dealerships. And uh, so I want to talk to you about that too. So let's kind of start there. Uh, what was your takeaway from the Detroit Auto Show? Um, it, it, it was two pronged, really. Um, if you were a shopper, I think it was a great show because there, there were vehicles that have been introduced over the last year or so, and the supply chain is so messed up today that you can't see them at a dealership, yeah. even though they've been on sale for five months. So that there was stuff that people haven't had a chance to see, and there were a bunch of new vehicles that aren't in dealerships yet that uh, people could also see. Uh, plus, the, the organizers of the show, they, they really did a great job turning it in, into a kind of a, a, a street fair almost. They, they had um, a, an electric Bigfoot truck, you know, those giant monster trucks? <clears throat> they had one of those just down the uh, riverfront, a, a short walk from the convention center, and it was running over old you know, wrecks, just like Bigfoot you know, monster trucks do. And that had people stand in line all the time. Uh, they, they had uh, a, a massive inflatable duck because Jeep owners have started putting little rubber ducks in the woods. I don't really understand why. But people were standing in line for that too. Um, so it was great fun, even though from a media perspective, there was a lot less news than there used to be at the Detroit Auto Show because of how auto shows have changed and because of all of the weirdness that's specific to this year. Uh, so I, 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 th I thought it was it was fascinating. It was watching it evolve. And I thought it was a pretty darn good show. That's and it showed the new Mustang for the first time. And any time you get to see a new Mustang, that's a good day. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. That's, so what did you think of the new Mustang? Oh, I like it a lot. I, I really do. Yeah. I, I think it's pretty much everything you know right with it. Um, the, it. It is probably the last time we will ever see an entirely internal combustion engine lineup for for the Mustang. Yeah. Um, and they're going to you know they, they are they, they, there will always be a Mustang, and they will find a way to do all electric versions of that nameplate in the classic coupe and convertible yeah. I have no doubt but uh, they, they you know they did it right you know they, yeah. it, it, it is fully reworked um, it looks like it's going to be fantastic to drive and it's got a lot of really useful new technology what what is the uh, entry level price on that car they haven't said yet but I would expect that it won't move a whole lot from where they are now yeah uh, it, 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 it'll be you know, within a couple of hundred dollars probably uh, of the current model sure sure now a number of the uh, uh, Japanese nameplates and a couple of other brands right that uh, haven't decided to pull out of the show right yeah that was unfortunate I I mean they, they didn't as you know but perhaps not everybody who's watching does yeah um, automakers have cut back on the number of press conferences and vehicle reveals sure. they do at all shows um, Interesting. and yeah and that's because you know they're experimenting with doing it online and and they feel like sometimes if they get everybody to come to an event with that they're totally control of they get better coverage uh, but on the other hand if you're a journalist that means Sometimes they want you to fly across the country to see what amounts to a new aerodynamic kit on a car that already exists. So there, there's competing interests. But because of that, uh, none of the uh, Japanese or European cars were showing had, had any press conferences. Um, and several, particular, I was particularly surprised by some of the Japanese. Toyota had a full corporate stand, uh, and they had some of their new vehicles. The uh, uh, the new Crown, which goes on sale early next year, I was driving that last week. That's an interesting car. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and some of their other stuff. They were there, but Honda had nothing. Nissan had nothing. Mm -hmm. There was you know, no stand for the Hyundai or Kia dealers. Wow. And, and all of those companies have got substantial numbers of dealers in the Detroit area. And they're so, making a huge wave. I mean, they're making big waves out there in the auto industry. I mean, exactly. their, their vehicles I, are incredible. 
Yeah, I, th I thought it was really, it, it, it was hard for me to understand why they wouldn't support their dealers at least having a little stand where they could show the vehicle that are available now, even if they weren't going to introduce, you know, the, the, the new CRV, for instance. That's right. Um, and they put, because they had extra floor face space available, they pushed the envelope, the organizers did, and, you know, they, they had more stuff with the, to, to show about electric vehicles. Uh, they brought in all the semi-finalists for North American Car and Truck of the Year, which, as a juror, I was happy to see them there. Uh, but they also had some, uh, they called them flying cars. They didn't really look like cars, but they were light aircraft that a person could buy and fly with without a, a real, you know, a, a official pilot's license. Uh, so there was a lot there to see. Wow. So talk to me about that. Is it kind of a drone vehicle or what, what how does it, how does no, the flight? No, these were all, these were all things that people could ride on or in. Um, and, and a couple of them are in production now. One of them is actually being developed at the uh, uh, old city airport in Detroit, which is a, a small airport that dates back, I think, possibly to the 1920s, certainly the 1930s. And it's so small, it doesn't get any commercial traffic anymore. And, you know, there was a company that was developing one there. No, there was one that was basically, uh, it was like a hover bike, like you see in Star Wars or The Mandalorian, you know, for instance. Um and uh, and it was just incredibly cool, and and that actually flies now. Uh, they had uh, a jetpack, you know, like like you'd see in in some of the old science fiction shows uh, that uh, works now, and, and a couple of uh, aircraft that you know people could you know basically you know park in their driveway um, if they wanted to, and all of these things. And I mean, some the prices on them obviously are, are pretty high. If I remember the. Uh, the the, the hover bike, I think, started just under $200,000. But people aren't going to be using these for commuting, but it's a really interesting growing part of transportation. Sure. Because I, I think if you thought of it like an ATV or a skidoo or a jet ski rather than as daily transportation, yeah. you can see a lot of people who would like it. I, I can imagine people, you know, having, the, there was one uh, electric flying boat, basically. It could land on ground or on the water. And I could easily see people flying that from Detroit or Chicago to their, you know, summer cottages, you know, in, you know, Traverse City, Michigan, and things like that. It was fascinating. That's incredible. Well, yeah. the other thing that's fascinating about our industry right now is it's going, as we know, all electric um, you know, very quickly. So uh, talk to us about that. What were some of the EVs uh, opportunities and offerings out there that impressed you the most? Boy, they're just booming this year. <clears throat> yeah. it's, it's amazing. I, I mentioned uh, North American Car and Truck of the Year earlier. Tomorrow I'm going out to a, a, an event that we get all of the semi-finalists together so we can drive them back to back. And for the first time ever, half of them are electric vehicles. It's just, it's astounding how fast the center of gravity in terms of where the industry is invested and focused is moving. And, and the rate at which the new vehicles are going to be introduced were introduced this year. And then over the next years, it, it's, it's only going to accelerate. There's so much stuff coming. That's right. Um, range anxiety still seems to be out there among consumers when you talk to them about uh, the, you know, their next purchase being an EV. However, experts you know, that I've spoken to that say, you know, if you think about you know, the, your, your cell phone, maybe 10 or, or I should say more than 10, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they were this much bigger phone and, uh, and look at it today and now it's a computer and a video camera and a pic, I mean, it does everything. So uh, you know, this whole range situation, probably in the course of the next 10 or 15 years, will be cleared up by just having a battery that lasts, you know, maybe 50,000 miles instead of, right? Um, is, yep. is that, is that yep. plausible to think that that's probably that's where the technology is going? Better battery technology, more charging stations and better charging technology. And also the, people will change habits. You, you mentioned the phone that you've got there. Yeah. You know, before iPhone, I would never have thought that I would be able to use a phone for as many things as I do, first of all. Right. But I also, it would have seemed like a huge inconvenience that I had this thing that I needed to always have its battery charged. That's right. You know, now I've got, you know, three inductive pads, you know, in different places in my house. My, one of, my phone is charging right behind me while we talk. So I literally can't remember the last time that I ran out of charge in my phone. And the Department of Ed studies show that 8% 
of electric vehicle charging right now happens at home, just like you know the, the vast majority of iPhone charging does. So people will have to get 240 volt uh, uh, chargers at home, and and that's you know, an expense, and and it's you know having some work done, but. Every EV owner that I know says the thing that amazes them is once they do that and they just get into the habit of plugging in when they get home at night every night and it automatically charges late at night when, when the rates are lower, then they never have to stop at another gas station. Uh, but the, the more immediate thing is part of what was in the Infrastructure Act that was passed last yeah. year, which is increasing the number of DC direct charge uh, fast charging mm -hmm. stations on major highways. That's right. Because it'll take, you know, plugged into the 240 that you'll have at home, it takes six hours to fully charge your battery. Yep. But if you plug into a powerful DC fast charger, you can, you know, get half a battery charge in maybe 20 minutes. And that's getting close to when you think not just of the time people spend holding the pump, but the total amount of time they spend when they get off the highway. You know, you, you get a drink, you go to you, you stretch your legs, you go to the bathroom and you charge because you don't have to be holding the, the nozzle the whole time you're charging uh, an EV. You plug it and you walk away. So when we get to the point that people can get a half tank in 20 minutes, that's when a difference becomes negligible to everybody. It's, it's just just incredible. Here we are talking about uh, EVs and flying cars and it's 2022 and my new grandson that uh, is only a couple of weeks old. It will be amazing to see, you know, what his first car is in the next 16 or 17 years. Uh, it, it may be an EV flying vehicle, right? <laughs> at, the yep. one, at the rate we're headed. And, and it cap he's going to look at it and say what is that <laughs> that's right <laughs> never put gasoline in the car probably <laughs> that's right that's right well mark feel an auto critic and columnist for the detroit free press check him out online he has got all the information you're looking for regarding the automotive industry just great great guy all around so mark thank you so much for joining us on the show we very much appreciate it i know our viewers and subscribers get a lot out of your visits with us so thank you i enjoy the conversations thank you jim thanks Thanks for watching Inside Automotive with Jim Fitzpatrick.